new industry to drive new jobs. We've got six presenters, all experts in their field presenting today, the first of which is Steve Rogers. So I'll hand over to Steve now to kick off the session. Thanks, Steve. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'll turn my video on. Uh, and uh, then we'll flip over onto uh, get my presentation up. So can you see the presentation? Uh, yep, I've got it. Okay, I'm just trying to put it on. Okay, all right, well, thanks. Thanks um, to you, Mac, and uh, the Bioenergy Australia organizers and everyone who's uh, listening into this session uh, for the opportunity of, of talking to you today. Um, for a start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, I'll pay my respects to the, uh, their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is, as we've heard in some of the previous sessions here, is about the importance for these bioenergy projects to actually have an off-taker. Uh, and the, um, the key point on these, uh, on, on these projects, you know, is that you, you not only have you got, a, have you got you know, access to your feedstock, uh, but you've also got to have a site where you can actually do a project and you've also got to have a conversion technology that, that's proven uh, and also you've got to have someone who's going to buy the products that you can actually make. Uh, and I think that if we actually look at the, um, those elements, uh, Tasmania is very well placed to do that. And often the missing part to these things is the off-taker uh, and the ability to have a long-term off-take agreement. Uh, and I think what we've got in Tasmania is the opportunity with the, uh, with the, um, the Trans-Tasman uh, ferries, which are owned by the government, uh, to be able to offer that. So that's, a, that's a sort of a, an opportunity that I'm going to sort of paint the picture for today. Um, before I sort of dive into that, I, uh, you know, just from a bit of on my background, um, I work for um, a company called uh, Lysella Holdings. Um, we are a, a technology development company. Um, we've, um, we've been developing our technology now for over 12 years in the advanced biofuel space. Um, so we're a technology provider and we typically work with uh, other parties to get the technology deployed. Um, due to the experience that I guess I've gained over that period of time, I'm also the representative um, from, from Australia's perspective in IEA Bioenergy Task 39, which is all about the commercialization of advanced biofuels. Um, so without, without further ado, just to put, put in perspective what Lysella does, Lysella produces a, a, um, an intermediate uh, in the form of a synthetic crude. And we can do that um, by taking residues from, uh, from biomass or residues from end of life plastics, and we can convert those into higher value products. So it's very similar to the traditional uh, fossil fuel industry in that we can produce a whole range of different products um, from the intermediate that we produce, and that includes fuels, chemicals, road products, uh, etc. Um, we've got a number of projects under development. Um, sadly, uh, the most these uh, for again from the, what the number of the speakers have said earlier, uh, the appetite overseas for adopting new technologies is greater uh, in other markets. Uh, certainly, more in that, being most notable being Europe uh, and in North America. Um, but we are, you know, we continue and are desperate to do projects in Australia uh, and New Zealand. We are looking at a feasibility of a project um, in, the, uh, in Queensland at the moment around bioenergy and also a couple of, of, of projects around uh, end-of-life plastics. So, um, you know, again, look, this shouldn't be new to anyone, but the reality is why are we doing this? Why are we doing all of this? You know, the reason we're doing this is, is that we, 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 Australia, have committed to, to, to the Paris targets, one and a half degrees. Um, we're currently at a degree, uh, and we can already see the devastation that that's causing uh, around, around Australia uh, and the damage that that's actually causing. We're at one degree. Uh, we're on currently on track unless we do something desperate, uh, do things quickly uh, to get to four degrees. Uh, if we get to four degrees, um, that means that that, that red band uh, on that chart there basically becomes uninhabitable. Uh, populations will start moving south. Tasmania, popular as it is now, is going to become even more popular. Um, but the world will be a very, very different place to what it is today. So the reality is we have to do things. 
and what we're starting to see now at last is that we're starting to get some real traction in this space. Um, the UK last year was the first um, the first um, uh, you know, developed economy uh, to pass into law. So in law now, by 2050, they will be uh, be carbon um, carbon neutral. Um, the EU has uh, now has its strategy for the same thing with targets 2030, 2040, and they have also put a put a regulation on the table to say that they want to be tar um, target to be carbon neutral by 2050. And, uh, and, and more recently, have put seven hundred and fifty billion dollars on the table as part of their, their their green recovery package. So, it just shows you the commitments that are starting to come into place. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, as well, we heard that China, China of all people, you know, we're hearing that they are now saying, okay, uh, they're only saying twenty sixty, but um, you know, that's uh, their op their opening part part in their next you know five year plan. So all of these commitments, uh, we have, yeah, those of you who caught up on what President-elect Biden has said this morning, he's recommitting the U.S. to uh, to uh, the Paris Accord, uh, and uh, and 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 is saying that trade development and their ties, they will use everything they can to leverage um, to make people do these things. And the reality is, this is the scale um, of what has to be. Um, and so there you can see that there's a massive amount of carbon reduction that's got to occur. Uh, and, uh, and what's driving, uh, what will drive that, you know, and this is what should be of interest to the Tasmanian uh, government, as it should be to our federal government, um, is that the, the, the amount of capital that will be deployed to make these projects actually happen. Decarbonisation is the story of, the, of this century. Uh, massive amounts of capital will be deployed, and that capital will flow to the areas, the geographies who are taking this seriously. Um, and we're already seeing, you know, behind that uh, projects. Who would have thought 12 months ago that you would hear BP saying that it's going to be carbon neutral by 2050 on, you know, on, on their one, two, and three, three emissions? And you can see that since that announcement, I know from talking to the people inside BP that, that you know, when that was announced in February, they went, what have we, you know, what have we done? But now we can see the progress that's actually happening. And of course, sadly, that's also, we've, we've seen the closure um, just two weeks ago of or the announcement of the closure of the BP refinery in Quinana. There is massive change happening. Uh, and, um, you know, it's now our opportunity to make the most of this. From, from the bio uh, perspective. So this is a company I'd just like to highlight to you, you know, which, uh, you know, should be, you know, I think, uh, you know, really of, of, of a lot of interest, uh, you know, to, especially to the Tasmanian government. Um, you know, this is a, Store Enso is a Swedish a Finnish company, uh, and they basically have demonstrated that, you know, everything that you can make today uh, from fossil fuels can be made from a tree tomorrow. So just think of that. Think about, you know, all of those, all of those commodities that the world is now reliant on. Forestry can now start driving that, okay? And these are, you know, these aren't just, uh, you know, low, low, low value uh, commodities. These are high value commodities. So if we look at the British, uh, if we look at the, um, if we look at what the British Columbian government and Canada have done here, they've put together this value hierarchy. And you can see at the bottom of there, there's bioenergy. So really what you're seeing is that that's just the, the, the base. If you want to get real value, you've got to work out how do you actually get plants established that will then enable you then to step up the value chain in terms of getting up into the biochemicals and biomaterials area. And those are the areas that, you know, you can actually start making, you know, creating lots of value and lots of high paid jobs. And that's the, that's where we should be heading. We are a high cost country. Uh, we've been trying to do projects in, um, in, in, in Australia and we look specifically at Tasmania since 2013. I can tell you we're a high cost country. If you're a high cost country, it means you've got to have a lot of added value. Okay. And that's where we should be focusing. Uh, but you've got to start, you've got to work out how you can start. Um, and, um, and, you know, this just sort of shows you why this is important. You know, where the fossil industry started, it started by looking at crude oil because they were after kerosene. And then, of course, what's happened over, you know, the past hundred years is they've worked out that actually there's much more valuable things in that crude oil. And you can see just there that at the moment, you know, this courtesy of the USDOE, 
you know, 17% of the barrel of oil delivers almost half of the value of, of, of all crude exports. So that's where, you know, Tassie should be thinking, that's where you've got to get to go. And then what that enables you to do is if you start with these, with these, with these projects at the bottom, which is the biofuels project plant, which I'm going to talk about very shortly, then that gives you the ability to leverage up to those higher value uh, technology, yeah, those higher value commodities which are available. But we've got to start. So where can we start? And this is why I think the, the, um, the um, Spirit of Tasmania and the, and the TT Lines opportunity is really relevant. Um, the, 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 the ferries, the Spirit of Tasmania that run backwards and forwards from Devonport into Melbourne, um, you know, they are, they are running on, he on heavy, uh, heavy fuel oil. Um, as they do the big crossing, they have, and, and they use diesel or, or marine gas oil as they're in the, uh, in, in the port areas. Two big changes have happened there from January the 1st this year. They've have to run on low sulfur fuel oil. Um, low sulfur fuel oil is, uh, is, um, is you know, not commonly available. Uh, it used to be all the rubbish in the barrel that used to go into, into those fuel oils. Um, but, and, and so there's some changes that have, that, that, that have had to be made to those ferries. Um, the other point is, is that the, the IMO has now come out with there, and it's come out as was talked about earlier, this 50% target, but you'll see at the bottom there it says, and at the same time, um, what's happening in, ma in maritime shipping is pursuing efforts towards phasing out greenhouse gas emissions um, totally. So that's another big challenge um, that the maritime industry is actually going to face as well as, as the aviation sector. So, so, so why would this be something that could be of interest, um, you know, to, you know, to the, to the ferries? Well, as, as we heard earlier from one of the speakers, you know, Tassie is about being green and, you know, clean and green, you know? So if you, you know, imagine we're basically saying, okay, all of the, all of the trade that goes on from backwards and forwards from the mainland to Tasmania on those ferries, um, you, know, you know, an example of how we can use Tassie innovation to actually get the ferries running on that. Um, the ferries now have to run on, on, on low sulfur fuels. Um, the options that they have at the moment, you know, with limited supply, is to run on marine gas oil. Uh, marine gas oil is akin to diesel, um, but it costs more. Uh, and so that's caused a 30% increase in the costs of fuels um, for the, the Spirit of Tasmania. Uh, and um, that, that's a cost that's burdened, uh, you know, that's in the millions of dollars, that's a cost that has to be burdened by the, by the Tasmanian government. Um, also, those, those fuels aren't available in Tasmania. One of the, if you look, look at one of the, the, the sort of the, the spirit, the, the way the, um, the Ultra sort of cooperation in which the ways that the TT lines run, the ferries are trying to put, you know, source as much as they can from Tasmania. Uh, fuels aren't available. Imagine if they could be. That's a, that's a good market source. The second highest cost on the ferries of after, after staff is fuel costs. Again, look at that as a positive that that could deliver to the Tasmanian economy. Um, and the other, the other point that the, the Tasmanian government has to put up with at the moment is the cost of hedging those fuel costs because clearly with, 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 with prices are fluctuating, uh, dramatically, they have to they have to uh, yeah, take out hedging costs, which again costs them millions of dollars. So, why is it relevant for biofuels? Well, biofuels are low in sulfur, right? So, the sulfur, the fuels that can be produced from low sulfur fuels are, um, you know, will meet that low so low sulfur fuel oil spec. Uh, they can be made in Tasmania. Uh, I'm sure if you were looking to establish a project. You know, the quid pro quo could be that you could fix the cost because if you had fixed price Australian inputs coming in and all your operational costs are in Australian dollars, why wouldn't you be able to fix the price of the, of the, of the, uh, the commodity that you're selling on the way out? But most importantly, if you get that project established, that project could then be the flywheel. You would have your biofuels plant there and international projects have shown that what happens is once you establish that plant, then you can start extracting more value from that from that from that facility. Um, and just to, just to put this in perspective, this isn't a fly fly in the air sort of idea. Uh, I sit on a working group um, in, as I said, on IEA Task Thirty Nine, we put on 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 looking at marine at at, um, at, at uh, the use of biofuels in the marine sector. 
Uh, we put this first report out in 2017. Uh, we we're currently working on another report, uh, which should be out next year. Uh, this is real. And you can see there that um, big companies, Maersk, you know, the largest um, shipping company in the world there, they have committed to being, uh, to being um, uh, um, greenhouse gas neutral by 2050. Uh, and they're spending a lot of work on, on doing this. And, and you can see that if you look, they've looked at all of the options that are available to them. And the one that stands out as being the cheapest way to achieve that and also integrate into their existing fleet is by using biofuels. So this is very possible. Uh, there's a lot of work going on internationally in this space. And I'm convinced that, you know, uh, if, if the Tasmanian government was interested in this, we could put together a consortia to look at this. And so what would that, would be, what would that envisage? You, know, you can see around the north, where there's a lot of the forestry plantations, there's a lot of feedstock, which would have to be assessed. Um, you have to have your, your um, location where you're going to do it. And there's already uh, a bio talk of uh, establishing a bio, bio energy precinct in the, in the Valley Central area there. Uh, and uh, also, as, I, as, as I've said, you've got the off-taker uh, in terms of the ferry operator who can take the fuel at the, fuel at the other end. So, you know, I think it's, uh, it's all possible. Um, and uh, then, as I said, what, what you've then got is once you've got that, that flywheel established, you're then able to be able to start extracting the value, um, you know, out of the crudes that are produced. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, looking at the work that we do on plastics, you can also start saying, okay, well, we can start looking at how we can uh, address the issue of problematic plastics in Tasmania as well. So these are the, uh, the non-recyclable plastics. So um, to uh, sort of close now, the, um, this is a, a statement put out by the head of the IEA. Uh, and the reality is that, you know, we desperately need solutions. Uh, this means that there's got to be coalitions which embrace governments, which could be the state government, it could be the federal government, uh, working with uh, through the likes of Arena. Uh, there are investors, and uh, some of those big companies I spoke about earlier are looking at projects. Uh, so we've just got to put that together, and that's how we can get this can get this project established. And with I and and Larcella and the rest of the group, you know, that we can put you in touch with, will be delighted in working. To help you achieve that. So my contact details of anything and uh, I'll hand back to you Mac. I don't know if you want questions now or at the end. Uh, thanks Stephen. I think we'll keep the Q&A for the end if that's okay. Um, so look thank you very much for that presentation. So next we've got Jeff Bell from Microbiogen presenting. Thanks. Thanks very much for that Mac. Let me just put this Oops, uh, we're going to share the screen and I want this one. Okay, is that okay, Matt? Can you see that all right? Uh, nothing's coming up on my screen. Ah, it should be. It's got a blue circle around it. It's not there. Uh, not on mine. I'm not sure if anyone else not can see mine, it. Deb. Sorry, did you say you can see it? No. No. No, no we can't. Okay. Um, let me try that again. Um, share the screen. And I'll try this one. Is that now sharing? Nope. Uh, not on mine, no. Let me try this one. No, maybe you have many screens open, like, you know. Files yeah, I do. Yeah, then um, you, you had to choose the right, uh, the, that, you know, your PowerPoint only. It will be showing you many other files but you just choose the right one yeah is that one showing
Try that one. And then there's a button on the bottom right. Oh, shit. Sorry. Okay, gotcha. Now you should be able to see it. Yeah, something's happening now. Yeah, it's come through there. Yep. Thanks, Steve. And so you can see the presentation? Yeah, we've got the PowerPoint in front of us. Yep. Right. All right. Sorry about that. It's okay. Let me, uh, for some reason, it's there. Yeah, okay. Um, look, thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk. So we're talking about these bio-based fuels and chemicals. Just a little bit of background about me first. I run a company, a CEO of a company called Microbiogen. Many of you probably haven't heard of us, but actually we're one of the world's leading industrial biotech companies. We're based in Sydney. Um, the technology we use can be used for a whole wide range of applications, food, feed, um, biochemicals, but also biofuels. Um, and in fact, biocatalysts developed right here in Australia are now producing a large part of the world's biofuels as we speak. So in the tens of billions of litres per year are, are using our, our strains. Um, that's basically on first generation biofuels. We are working uh, on our third phase of a, a, uh, an $8 million arena program, uh, optimising biocatalysts for second generation bioethanol production. That's going very, very well. We expect to complete that in March next year. Our final strains are going across to our global corporate partners in the next week or so. So that's all pretty exciting stuff. And finally, just by way, by way of background, Steve's in task 39, I'm in task 42 of the IEA Bioenergy. And what we tend to look at is biorefineries, which is not just fuels, but multiple uh, products, including uh, biochemicals, et cetera. So exactly what Steve's talking about, and that is trying to get higher uh, value from um, biofuel and bioproducts. So what I wanna talk about is, quite briefly what some of the dominant platforms are because I'm talking about biofuels here. And I wanna talk about, and I will then focus in onto, onto ethanol just simply because there's so many platforms and it's where our expertise is. I wanna talk about why ethanol is such a great opportunity and product, a little bit about ethanol future supply and trends, and then ethanol is the new crude oil and all those applications that are potentially out there and what the opportunities and challenges are for Tasmania. So if you look at biofuels today, there are just a ton of platforms out there. You can see on the left-hand side, syngas, biogas, algaes, organics, pyrolysis, et cetera. The leading, the leading biofuels today are based on the C6 and C5 sugar platforms, as well as bio uh, plant-based oils. And you can see if you look to the right, that what you have is your sustainable biomass supply. And typically, in, and we're now talking about the um, C5, C6 and plant, you have a sustainable pre-treatment and then you end up, end up with a whole lot of uh, products that come out. And that's what IEA Bioenergy Task 42 looks at. So why is ethanol such a great opportunity? And I've just, a little bit of detail here, I'll just spend one minute on it. If you look to the left-hand side, biomass is typically 70 to 75% sugar. If you're talking about food, it's 70 to 75% sugar with 25% protein and other material. If you're looking at biomass, it's 70 to 75% sugar and the rest is, is lignin. If you can separate, and this is what a lot of technology is about, is those, those sugars into a separate uh, uh, stream, then what becomes important, and this is what's, what's really interesting about ethanol, is if you take one tonne of sugar and it contains, say, 1,000 energy units, put it through a yeast fermentation, you end up with basically three products. You'll end up with almost half a tonne of carbon dioxide, which is zero energy effectively, or zero potential energy. You'll end up with a little bit of protein from the biocatalyst that converted it, but you'll also end up with about half a tonne of bioethanol. And you'd look at that and go, well, that's terrible. You know, you've gone from one tonne of sugar to half a tonne of ethanol, that's 50% efficiency. But actually, because what the yeast are doing, they're just rearranging molecules very efficiently. And that almost half tonne of bioethanol contains about 900 energy units. You're only losing 10% roughly of the contained energy in sugar to your product. So it's super, super efficient, this conversion. That's one of the attractions of um, ethanol uh, using the biochemical process. Um, you also get some carbon dioxide, which you can um, you know, sequester for a negative type plant, or you could use it for other applications. So 
it's not just about extraordinarily high energy conversion efficiency. It's um, some of the advantages as, as a potential product around the world. You, you, there's no shortage of, of biomass, which means there's about 75 billion tons of sugar. Obviously not all available, but you can see that there's a lot of it around. And you know, when you're talking about a, a, country, a state like Tasmania, they do have significant wood and crop residues and they're abundant, which gives it some natural advantages. Another benefit is when you produce ethanol, it's a pure product, it's just ethanol, which gives you a whole range of applications, which I'll talk about a little bit later. It's clean and safe, no high pressure, no, no risks, it's, it's a simple product. And the product itself you can drink, as you would be aware. As I talked about, you can sequester the, the CO2 or use it for other applications. And using processes, um, the current process, you get a very small amount of um, uh, highly nutritious feed as a byproduct. Um, on our arena funded 2G project, we're gonna be changing that calculation quite significantly. So you can take your waste biomass, that's your trees, your non-food product, put it through a, a lignocellulosic biomass process plant and you'll produce um, high quality ethanol, but you will also produce a significant amount of high protein, high quality, high value feed. And that's kind of a bit of a game changer. And that's been a project we've been working on for 15 years and it's coming very close to fruition now. So a little bit about ethanol supply and future trends. You can see here in Australia, you tend to think that ethanol, well, it's not going anywhere. It's been flat for a long time. In fact, biofuels in general. But if you look around the world, you can see that if you look at the last 25, 30 years, there has been a significant increase in, in bioethanol production. The dark green being what's used for fuel and the non-fuel is the paler green. Not only has it been going up, but it's gonna to continue to rise as well. As you look around the world, North America, Brazil, Europe, a lot of countries are mandating and going through and expanding the, uh, the ethanol production. And this is one area where Australia really has been missing out. Whether it's bioethanol or biocrude or whatever, we just haven't been doing the work. And you know, we are highly, you know, we import most of our fuels. To me, it makes absolutely no sense at all, but that's the world we live in. But certainly we can see that this is a, a growth industry and there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, ethanol is a new crude. That's something that I think is really interesting. If you look at biofuels today, almost 70% produced are, are bioethanol. In terms of, and bioethanol shouldn't be just thought of as a fuel, it's also a chemical precursor. And if you look at the world in terms of biochemicals, about 330 million tonnes are produced per year uh, already, but about 90 million tonnes of bio-based chemicals are produced today, of which over 90% is ethanol. So ethanol is currently the dominant biofuel and biochemical today. And that's partly because what I talked about before, it's high conversion efficiency, the availability of sugars and it's multiple applications. In fact, I wanna talk a little bit more about those applications because most people aren't really aware of this. Once you've got your ethanol from your sugars, if you're talking about a lignocellulosic ethanol plant, you can, mix the ethanol with the lignin if you separate the lignin and there you have a low sulfur marine fuel. There are companies in Europe working on this now. You can take the ethanol, you can dehydrate it to ethylene and then ethylene can go to plastics amongst other products. You can use catal catalysts to convert from the, the ethanol to butadiene to butadiene, which is where you can produce tires, toys, hoses, etc. Technologies are out there, multiple companies, Vertimas, et cetera, have technology to convert the alcohol to jet. And what I'm talking about is remember, ethanol is very, very efficiently produced and it's cheaply produced. In the US, they're producing ethanol around 45 cents per litre. So really, really cheap. So remember, when you fill up your car, yes, of course, there are taxes, but you're paying a dollar plus. So very, very competitive product. You can use it as an oxygenate enhancer, as, as they do in the US, or you can make it as your primary fuel, as they do in Brazil. There's no reason this can't be done. There's no real challenges in terms of uh, fuel supply, infrastructure. These are all relatively easy compared to a lot of alternative or, or competing technologies. And then also you can make diesel, effectively diesel style engines out of the ethanol. So very widely applicable. And this, you know, 
it builds resilience once you have some of this technology deployed in a country. So in terms of Tasmania, we think it's a, it's a biomass rich state. There's no reason why this sort of stuff can't uh, occur there. As you'd all be aware, too much reliance on, on imports. We're 90% plus imported now. As, as Steve said, they're shutting down biorefineries or, or, or oil refineries. Um, not enough diversity in manufacturing. So this will help them at diversification and it increases that resilience. You have an, you know, Tasmania has a natural advantage in ethanol production, could be a significant ethanol producer. It diversifies away from those imports. Um, and look, you know, can we use a hand sanitizer when there's a pandemic? But it's certainly all about, uh, it would also boost your regional employment. What's needed to progress? Look, this isn't easy um, at all because there are huge challenges to, to deploy this um, in Australia and uh, around the world. Um, we think you need mandates to break the stranglehold of the incumbents because it's very difficult to get into the fuel supplies if you're doing it as a fuel. You need economies of scale. Ethanol, I think most projects aren't going to be economic if you produce at the very small scale. So you need to talk about reasonable scale, which means dollars. And then you need, if you're going to have dollars, you need a fully integrated approach. You need to have that whole biomass supply, your infrastructure, finance. You need that regulatory environment uh, in, in place and you need the market access as well. So all those have to, if you've missed one of those, it's not gonna happen. So look, thanks very much. I just wanted to get through that quickly and I'll happily take questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, just get you to stop sharing, Jeff, if that's possible. Yep, just um, trying to find what's happened to my screen. Uh, where are we? Here we go. I sound like an idiot, but now I can't find my... Cannot. Here we go. Got it. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, you look, great presentation. Thanks. Actually, sorry, Jeff. We've got you video off, but we've still got your screen up. And you're, you're on mute, Jeff, sorry as well. Steve, do you, if you're there, do you remember how to stop yeah, sharing? Uh, Jeff, if you at the top of your screen, it says um, you, there's a green thing and then it says you are viewing and then it says view more options. And then if you hit that click, there you go. Yeah, perfect, thanks so much, cheers. Thanks, Jeff, much appreciated. So next we move on to Barry King from Global Fuel Solutions. Thank you very much, Barry. Hey, evening, oh, yeah, good morning, everybody. So, to share my screen. So, um, Global Echo Fuels, a uh, technology company also. Uh, we have a slightly different technology to Lysella and uh, we directly produce uh, drop-in diesel fuel. Um, we're based in Europe currently and um, uh, we are, although we have been working in Australia to bring a project to, uh, to projects to Australia. So I've been asked to uh, talk about the potential for advanced fuels in uh, Tasmania, as um, I was kindly shared the uh, 2015 report uh, by Martin Moroni, and it estimates that uh, plantation, uh, the report only covers um, plantation forests and doesn't include any old, old growth uh, primary forests. So within the um, Within the plantation, there's 3,300 tons uh, green or 1,800 kilotons of dry, which uh, is about 30% of the total uh, Tasmanian energy demand. If uh, in our if advanced biorefineries that you've heard about today, for example, uh, took 12% only of that resource, because it's impractical to believe that all of that resource would be available, uh, you could build six advanced fuel biorefineries producing uh, over 100 million litres of fuel. Uh, you also have the capability to develop other resources we heard about today, 
Uh, there's uh, 600,000 600, tons of municipal solid waste and commercial waste aggregated, eight and a half million tons of agricultural residues. And I know Tasmania is a very similar climate and uh, in geography to New Zealand. And uh, they're in, over there, they're talking about silver culture for energy as well. So there's lots of um, potential feedstocks that could uh, support extensive uh, industry uh, of all types of technologies. So what's the benefit of um, these refineries on, uh, on an economy like Tasmania's? Obviously for Australia, there's advanced fuels for flight and freight we've heard a lot about. There's climate action and greenhouse gas mitigation and fuel security for Australia, but in particular, you'd have onshore fuels in Tasmania as well. And decentralized jobs and investment. Each of uh, each plant mech facility would have about 30 direct jobs and many more indirect jobs. And uh, six facilities like that would have an investment between 400 and 500 million dollars of inward investment into Tasmania. Talking a little bit about our technology, uh, this is our facility in, uh, in Spain. It's a, a mechanical catalytic conversion technology, uh, which is, um, takes lignocellulose directly into uh, a number of products, but it principally uh, a middle distillate diesel fuel, which we then uh, upgrade to uh, drop in diesel. The technology itself is two thermal process steps, the mechanical catalytic conversion, which is uh, generally uh, less than 370 degrees. And then we have a separate desulfurization and fractionation technology, which produces uh, the individual products, kerosene and drop-in diesel. We can convert any organic feedstock, fossils, biogenic or cross-contaminated material, woody biomass and waste wood, and the organic fractions of uh, commercial and municipal solid waste. Our outcomes are middle distillate fuels meeting EN590 or low sulfur Australian diesel standard. And we also produce a biogenic bitumen product, which uh, can substitute for fossil bitumen. We identified early on the need to have a standalone biorefinery. So we separately developed a um, alternative fuel upgrading process, not using hydrogen. And uh, we take our raw fuel, or as it comes out of the conversion technology, uh, which is in the top left of that picture there, and uh, convert, it, uh, convert it into um, uh, drop-in diesel. Uh, in, this, in this case, it was made from uh, Australian blackbutt material. The main reason we identified that need is um, it's difficult to access uh, existing refineries and hydro treating, especially obviously with the news of Granana closing down, for example, and also the high capital cost of and scaled hydro treaters and access to hydrogen logistics and storage is another problem. So having a, a separate uh, up fuel upgrading process makes a big difference. So the MEC, uh, our typical plant for us would be a uh, MEC-16, which is um, 16 reactors around the uh, central processes. A plant like that would use 60 kilotons of biomass, producing 18.6 million liters of uh, low sulfur fuels. It has a greenhouse gas intensity of 13 and a half grams of CO2 per megajoule, which is an 84% saving over the fossil fuels. We also have a co-product, 16,000 tons of biobitumen, and if all of those products are combined, each plant would avoid 81,000 tons of CO2. So six MEC-16 projects between now and 2030, for example, would divert 500,000 tons of CO2 emissions. The last slide here also comes from the International Energy Agency. Some of you may have seen it. It uh, shows the need for uh, alternative uh, advanced biofuels. Uh, going forward to meet early and um, mid climate change targets. The blue sector there is the, um, is the bio advanced biofuels. Anyway, that's the end of my, um, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, I think the next presenter is Prasad Kapraji from Griffiths. Second and I'll stop sharing.
Can't get back to the main screen. Uh, it's now a Word document. Is that yours, Barry, or yours precisely? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm just. I've got the Zoom. I'm just trying to find the right Zoom pages. It's not so getting me back to this. To me, you go to the top of the screen. Yeah. So the mouse and there's a little green sign there, or a little red sign that you can. I no, I've got the main. In, I got the. I've got the main invite here. Oh, here we go. Sorry, it's over. Here. Wrong screen. There you go. Sorry about that. Perfect. That's okay, Barry. Thank you so much. Okay, so next, passing over to uh, Prasad Kaparaju from the Griffith University. Thanks, Prasad. Thank you. Yeah, is it shared? Yep. Perfect, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Bioenergy Australia and also the Tasmanian government for organizing this uh, wonderful event uh, on Tasmania Bioenergy Future for 2020. And of course, uh, today I'm gonna present uh, the importance of uh, biomethane uh, as a fuel to decarbonize our energy and transport sector. And uh, also the first results of biogas upgrading in Australia. So I'm working as an associate professor at Griffith uh, University in a School of Engineering and Built Environment. And uh, the project, the ENINA granted uh, project that I'm uh, going to present is about uh, utilizing the sugarcane industry residues, uh, for example, sugarcane bagasse and trash for producing biogas and then upgrading that produced biogas as a vehicle fuel. Now, we all know that uh, that the biomethane production has actually uh, picked up in the last couple of years, especially since uh, 2010. Uh, and the, now the global biomethane, when I say biomethane is that the biogas has been upgraded to a quality that is either for grid, uh, gas grid injection or for a vehicle fuel. And then if this biomethane is then compressed, then we call it as a bio CNG. So the total global biomethane production has reached about uh, 3 billion uh, normal cubic meters in 2017. And this has seen an exponential growth, uh, especially in the European market. Uh, as you know that uh, Germany is one of the leading country uh, uh, in terms of uh, biomethane for natural gas uh, injection, while Sweden used to be the leader in the biomethane for vehicle fuel use. Uh, so the total number of biogas uh, upgrading units, biogas upgrading units has uh, now counted to be 678 uh, as of uh, last year's data. Uh, and the capacity, as you can see on the screen, that uh, it has been increasing steadily. So, uh, uh, and now it has reached about uh, almost uh, half a uh, million uh, normal cubic meters per hour of raw biogas. That is before the biogas is actually upgraded. Now, more recently, uh, US has become the world leader uh, when it comes to the biomethane use as a vehicle fuel. And it's mainly because of the state and federal uh, laws in terms of uh, uh, legislation being passed uh, to actually utilize the biogas as a, as a source of uh, uh, energy for decarbonizing their energy and transport sectors. And also interestingly, China and India are actually uh, looking at this uh, use of biogas as their uh, energy uh, for replacing the transport uh, fuels. Coming to Australia scenario, so as you see that uh, Australia is uh, actually really uh, has an emerging biogas industry. Uh, and you can see that uh, that uh, there were like 242 biogas plants as of uh, 2017, uh, and they are able to produce about uh, 1.2 uh, terawatt hours of electricity, uh, which can be accounted for almost 0.5% of the national electricity generation. But we have a huge potential. Uh, we can see that uh, the total potential is estimated to be around 103 terawatt hour 
per annum. Uh, that's around 371 petajoules. Uh, so if you take it at the, at the international level, that 371 petajoules is the actual uh, biomethane that is being produced currently in Germany. So that's the prior context I can actually refer to. Now, if he can actually use that, then we are able to replace about 9% of the total Australian energy consumption. Uh, so that's a quite big number. Uh, but uh, the positive things that we can take from here is that even if you use 20% of the potential biogas, uh, we are able to actually replace almost 6.9% of our greenhouse gas emissions as a nation. So the leading uh, biomethane producers in the world are, of course, uh, Germany followed by UK. Okay, and then... Uh, Now, as you can see, the most of the speakers today, we are all are talking about the most important thing uh, uh, that is actually the, the uh, drivers or motivation for going for biofuels or bioenergy is the decarbonization of our economy, especially in the transport and energy sectors. Uh, so, so biomethane would definitely be the major, uh, what you call intermittent before we actually shift to hydrogen economy. Uh, so we are thinking that that um, that this would be our major source of uh, re resource of renewable energy to provide secure uh, and continuous and dispatchable uh, energy source, and also replace the cooking and heating and hot water uh, in in the mostly in the what do you call uh, the the regional Australia, especially because uh, regional Australia uh, is a kind kind of a shortage of uh, energy in terms of uh, electricity and also uh, in terms of gas because they are not connected to the gas grid. So then also provides a major uh, alternate route for uh, reducing the waste that is being sent to the landfills. So because uh, I think if on a global scale, Finland is the only country uh, or the first country to actually amend a, a landfill directive. That means that there is no organic waste going to landfills. Uh, so it, and also reducing their landfill numbers uh, to maybe two in a, 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 at a country level. So this is kind of a brave uh, foot that they have actually ventured into. And then uh, so then also it has actually helps us to create a lot of jobs, uh, especially in the regional Australia, when we can actually utilize our organic waste to produce biogas and then upgrade this biogas uh, for, for bio fuel for vehicle fuels. So the project that we are working on uh, is almost at the fag end of this uh, uh, project is the Arena funded project uh, that is the integration of biogas from sugarcane residues uh, in the sugar mill industry to reduce the fossil fuel usage. Now the whole idea of this project is actually to replace the diesel consumption in the cane transport from the farm or, or the uh, from the fields to the to the mills, uh, so in, we are trying to utilize the sugarcane biogas or trash uh, as a feedstock to produce biogas, and then uh, use this biogas, upgrade it, and produce a vehicle fuel that can replace the the transport or uh, transport. I mean, basically the diesel consumption, which is now around 0.1 liters per ton of uh, cane. So this is the first uh, biogas upgrading unit in Australia. So this is a, a basically a pilot scale plant. Uh, uh, you can see on the screen, so, so there are four stainless steel uh, 1.2 cubic meter reactors uh, where we are feeding the sugarcane trash. And then the produced biogas is then stored into this uh, big container here. It's a kind of a biogas storage system where we have a bladder that can fill up about 20 cubic meters of biogas. Now the produced biogas is then fed into a, this uh, container in the backyard. So that's basically the high pressure water scrubbing uh, biogas upgrading unit, uh, which is about 10 cubic meters per hour raw biogas capacity. Once we have 
cleaned the biogas and upgraded the biogas. Then we feed it to this compressor here. And uh, this is a compressor that can actually uh, uh, compress the biogas, uh, biomethane in a three stage process to almost uh, 200 bars. Uh, so that gas is then slowly fed into these gas bottles, which are here. And these gas bottles can take about 50 liters of gas. And then we can have about 200 bars in these uh, gas bottles. So that cleaned and upgraded biogas, when it is compressed, then we call it as a bio CNG. And that can be used straight away in, in, a, in our petrol engines with the slight modifications. So the mod modifications are basically to reduce, you should have a reducer for press, pressure reducer uh, at the injection ports. Uh, and then also all the, all the fuel lines has to be stainless steel grade. Now what you're seeing on this uh, slide is the, the biogas composition, right? So, and also uh, the comparison of other biogases coming from landfill or, or full-scale biogas plants that are operating on, on, on manure. And then we can compare with our natural gas, which is being uh, used as our cooking gas or, or any uh, fuel gas. Uh, so now we have done the lab scale reactors first and optimized the biogas process. And then we've moved on to the pilot scale uh, where we are actually producing now currently this uh, gas, which has a calorific value of, of about 18 uh, megajoules per cubic meter. And the warp index is almost near to a landfill gas uh, uh, warp index. So that is basically the, the higher value of the, the warp index. The methane concentration is slightly lower than what we were expecting, but because of course this is a carbohydrate rich feedstock. So, so the maximum you can expect is around 53 to 55. And we are almost uh, there. And the hydrogen content is around zero to 3% by volume. Now, what is happening during the biogas process? So biogas upgrading process. So during the biogas upgrading process, we will clean up all the nasties like hydrogen sulfide, volatile organic compounds, siloxones, and, and other uh, compounds like ammonia and water vapor. Now we need to remove this because this will actually either hinder in the combustion process or uh, produce some other uh, compounds that are actually uh, affecting the performance of your engines. For example, if you have siloxones, siloxones are actually coming from uh, the, the shampoos, for instance, or industry uh, products, or you can also find in the landfill. And uh, these actually end up in the biogas. And when they are actually burned, uh, when the biogas is burned, then these actually produce a silica kind of material that is very hard to actually uh, remove or can damage the pistons and cylinders. So here is the siloxones. Uh, so we can see that in our biogas, we have basically none, right? Uh, they are mostly below the detection limits. Uh, from our system. So the only th thing what we have seen the siloxones is the, the, the decamethyl cyclopentyl silo siloxone. And that is around 160 uh, micrograms per uh, cubic meter. So all this has to be cleaned up. And so uh, this is before the biogas uh, is being fed into the upgrading unit. But after we have produced uh, the biomethane, uh, we will not have any, actually, no siloxones. Prasad, sorry yeah. to jump in, Smack here. Just conscious of time, we've still got two other presenters. And yeah, yeah. To that's right. Yeah. So. I, I just jumped there. Yeah, so, here, so here is the here is the bar, raw biogas concentration uh, before being upgraded. And then you have the biomethane that is after the upgrading process. So we have moved from the methane concentration of 60 to 96%. So that's basically the vehicle fuel quality that is required if you want to use it uh, as a vehicle fuel. And also the HGS is almost uh, in the right limits, which has to be less than one PPM. Now the energy requirements are here. So the electricity consumption is about 1 to 1.2 to 1.4 kilowatt hour per kg of biomethane. Uh, our water consumption is around 10 liters per kg of biomethane. 
So here is a snapshot of uh, different feedstocks that I have worked in my life uh, before. Uh, so it means that if you have uh, so many tons of uh, uh, biomass and how much methane it is producing and how much uh, uh, bio methane that can be used uh, or can be used for driving around 10,000 kilometers per hectare per annum. So, so we have, with this, I would like to conclude that uh, we have shown that uh, high pressure upgrading, uh, biogas upgrading is uh, an efficient and cheap <coughs> and environmentally friendly process to remove the carbon dioxide and other uh, components in the, in the biogas and then produce a biomethane that is actually meeting a, a vehicle fuel standard. Uh, and then the energy requirements and uh, water requirements are, can be optimized. Uh, to still reduce the, the economics of biogas upgrading. And uh, we have seen no selections in, in the byproduct or uh, the product gas that is biomethane. So I thank uh, Irina for, uh, for the pro funding this project and also my key uh, collaborators and partners in this project, the QUT, uh, Sunshine Sugars and Utilitas. Thank you and if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Prasad. We'll, we'll leave the Q&A to the end for all yep. presenters. But Thank just you. on that point, just to mention that the, the chat function should be available to people. So if people wanted to start writing in some questions for the presenters, then please do, and I'll get to those in the session. Um, otherwise, Prasad, if you're happy to exit your screen, and then the next presenter is Jennifer Lover patterson from Frontier Impact Group. Are you there, Jennifer? I am. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Beautiful. I'm just seeing how to share. And I think I'm just about there. Thank you. Perfect. Let me know when you can see it. Yep, it's now sharing. Beautiful. Fantastic, wonderful to be here. And I've really enjoyed everyone's presentations and the wonderful opportunities that, that now currently exist and I think are commercially viable in the bioenergy space. Our focus today is to talk about a case study. Um, it's a feasibility that we've been involved in, um, the Collie Renewable Diesel Refinery. And it's been a really great outcome um, of what we've seen. Um, and what we expect um, is to actually get to um, um, construction next year in terms of the project. Um, we're very fortunate because we did get a um, small um, grant from the W. Jennifer, we have lost your sound. Are you still with us? Jennifer, have we lost you entirely? Are you not present? Okay, we might just stand by for two minutes and just wait to see if Jennifer's going to jump back on. We'll just give it another minute and otherwise I might ask our next presenter to jump in and then we will slot Jennifer in at the end if that's okay. I'm just sending Jennifer a text message now.
Mac, we've just lost Jennifer on the um, on the line, so oh, I've okay. sent her a text message. But maybe should we, oh, hang on. she's dialing back in right now. So should we give it another thirty seconds? Yep, no problem. Thanks. You jinxed us, you know. Yep, I know that. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Nobody knows. It's all fine. But I did just suggest if Jennifer's not back on. Oh, hang on. Okay, she's asked if somebody else can go. So can you move on to the next one, Mac? And I'll yeah, have happy Jennifer to. get back on. Yeah, no problem. So we've got Michael Berry from the University of the Sunshine Coast presenting next. No worries, Mac. I'm right here. I'll share my screen. Okay, you should be able to see that. Yeah, perfect, thanks so much. Perfect, all right. So yeah, my name is Michael Berry. I'm a research fellow at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And I'm gonna be talking about the biomass supply chain. So pretty much the feedstock side. So coming from the IA Bioenergy Task 43 group. So, you know, when Barry was talking about, you know, the quantity of supply and, you know, then using that material um, for higher end usage, it really comes down to, okay, we know that supply is there, but how do we get that supply in a form that can then be used um, to make biofuel or to make pellets or to make any kind of bioenergy product or other product in the conversion process? So this presentation really focused on the supply chain associated with that feedstock. So getting the forest residue material from, from the forest into, a, into a, um, you know, a, a process material or chip material that can then be used to support any number of product productization uh, beyond that. Um, so that's that's the context. Um, we're doing a little case study today on some work we've done in Queensland. Um, but again, you can see the pictures on the left and right. It's really, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the material that's left over after a, a harvest that can then, you know, it's traditionally burned or used or, or not used. And we're looking at using that effectively within the supply chain and enabling that. Um, so yeah, again, in the Queensland context, um, we're kind of in the midst of a, you know, a bio revolution of sorts, but ba basically looking at that material, that harvest residue as a product, right? So then using that material as a product to then support, you know, the rest of the supply chain elements. So partners here are uh, HQP plantations and other, other members. We have people looking at, you know, uh, using this feedstock for pellets, using this feedstock for traditional bioenergy, um, with electricity or, or, or heating. And we have um, them looking at potentially this feedstock or these residues for other traditional elements like MDF plants and whatnot. So when you look at that supply chain, you know, when we're out in, out in, the, in the forest, you know, producing timber or producing logs, um, there's different harvesting methods we're using. And really that's where the supply chain starts because you have to remember in a forestry context, the waste residues are a byproduct. You know, we're trying to look at them as a product, but that is not the main show here. There's much higher value products from saw logs and you know, other elements that are you know, in the marketplace and, and commoditized already at a higher value, and it will continue to be that. So this really is, while it's a product, biomass it is a byproduct and, it's, and it should be seen as such. So when we're out in the forest, you know, doing uh, forest operations to extract value, we're looking at you know, cut the length and whole tree harvesting techniques. And for the sake of argument today and the time we have, you know, really when they cut the length and that's most of Tasmania will be you know, considered that uh, within the eucalyptus plantations. But you really have a biomass that's scattered around inside the coop. Okay, so that's the, that's the starting point, just material that's strewn about um, as an artifact of the harvesting technique. In whole tree harvest, that material is more consolidated at roadside. So, okay, that's, that's how it's you know, harvested initially and material is left over and that's our harvest residues, but how much is actually recoverable? So we've done many studies across Australia. Again, the, the Queensland study here is amplified, exemplified, but really it depends on that harvesting technique. So it depends on, and it depends on those products that you're actually extracting for value to start with as to what that actual material looks like. 
as far as the quality of it, the quality of it, the piece size of it, you know, the, the amount of dirt or imperfections that are inside uh, uh, of the residue profile, and how much residue is there. So on a general context, at least when we're looking at Southern Pine over here in Queensland, it's oftentimes referred to as 10 to 20 green tons per hectare is you know, theoretically extractable. So that's kind of your baseline of material that you can actually bring off the coop at any given place within the plantation. So now you know what's extractable, we got to figure out just how to get that material and what are the costs and supply chain associated with moving that raw material from you know, where it sits in the forest to roadside to then being you know, processed to a market. But you have a couple of different steps, you know, moving the raw material and processing the raw material. So grinding or chipping it and getting it into a form where it then can be transported and then can be used as a feedstock or some other product and then transporting that raw material. So long story short, there's a lot of different options, a lot of different ways. It depends on that profile of material. It depends on what your quality and quantity considerations are. It depends on how far away you are from that processing depot, where those materials are gonna end up going as far as those efficiencies and relative cost. So in our group, in our work, we deal with those multitude of options to try to optimize that for any given setting in any given state and any given feedstock profile. Um, so one way to look at it and kind of the critical you know, piece, of, you know, piece of this is where are we gonna process the material? So it comes in a, a raw bulky form, you know, somewhere it's, whether it's consolidated or not, you know, whether we're gonna pile that or whether we're gonna go out and get that material you know, at the source or at roadside. But effectively, you have, to, you, know, you have to go through and process that material, put it in chipped or ground form to then transport effectively. So you can process that material at the source you can process it along the roadside. You can, you know, can pile it up before you process it. You can process it as it sits. You can do that in a centralized landing or a centralized facility, or you can remove all that raw material and ship it to a, a, a proper facility and, and do processing there. So there's a multitude of avenues to do that. And it really depends again on that, how much material you have, how easy is, is it to access in the coop? How easy is it to move? How much of those costs? You know, what are the relative uh, cost factors associated with that? So within you know, this you know, preliminary analysis, we looked at, you know, we highlighted 12 different potential um, supply chain elements or supply chain pathways and looked at the cost of production, realizing that that depends on the volume, depends on the piece size, depends on the placement, depends on your productivity, depends on the utilization rate of those machines, depends on that distance, you know, equipment costing, all those variables. So you know, I guess in the context of a discussion today, realizing, yes, there is a lot of feedstock out there, but to get it into a form and into a location that you actually need it is not as simple as it may appear. And it depends a lot on what that material looks like, what equipment you have, and the costing associated with that. Um, from some of this analyses, we looked at you know, highly mobile techniques to you know, more centralized techniques. And that, that, you know, that cost in supply chain could cost anywhere from $25 a ton to $70 a ton. And that may or may not be you know, economically feasible or effective, depending on your product and your higher value usage. That's all part of this. Um, for our purposes of this little project I'm exemplifying today, we looked at or the, the preferred supply chain pathway came out to be um, kind of more highly mobile, highly adaptive um, you know, in situ um, extraction and productization techniques. So basically chipping in the, in the coop where the material lays um, as a way to limit uh, handling of the material, limiting, limiting the overall cost of production of that material. But ultimately it comes down to, you know, the supply you have, but also the contractors and the willingness, willingness of you know, the landowner or the, the forestry group to actually invest in equipment and materials to do this. Um, anyway, this was the preferred method, again, being highly mo mobile, um, high quality, being able to service multiple markets and different feedstocks. So in Queensland, we're looking at you know plantation as of course, you know one particular feedstock. But we're also looking at um, private native forests as another particular feedstock, and using a variety of different methods to then use the same equipment on multiple feedstocks in multiple areas for you know a sense of resiliency within the supply chain for this particular contractor. Um, another innovation we're looking through and is you know is uh, desirable in this case is a sequence of. Uh, kind of modular uh, bin technology and a lot and even the stuff that we're kind of talking about is highly used and researched in Europe. So again some of the other themes that we're talking about today 
these technologies, these techniques, we're all we're deploying techniques that Europe has used 15, 20 years ago, and we're reapplying and um, kind of adapting for our, our needs. But anyway, so the transportation options, looking at kind of um, hook lift bins, um, drop off modularity again, providing an element of resiliency within the supply chain, realizing that there's you know there's, there's a complex variable when the coop is. Um, harvested when it needs to be, you know, material needs to be extracted and allowing for that um, sense of uh, flexibility within the, within the supply chain, within the material resource profile. Um, and something that, you know, is, is really important within this context of the raw material feedstock is that element of moisture content. So the moisture content of the material moving through supply chain is actually a big deal. You can imagine, you know, the wetter the material, um, you're basically just moving water around and it's not very cost effective. Um, so the price that one can pay depends on, you know, how much water is in, uh, is in that material as it moves through the supply chain, but that can you know, increase or decrease the overall you know, cost or value of that material by 30%, which could make or break that supply chain and is often not really negotiated well, um, you know, within the supply contracts, but it's incredibly important within the logistics and the processing perspective that we have here. And again, more water, the less uh, energy dense you have. So you can look at, you know, a moisture content also as a proxy for energy density, which then impacts, you know, the price you can pay for a certain amount of energy supply at a certain amount, at a certain time and location. Um, another aspect of this whole supply chain is, you know, the, the value that you can pay or that is acceptable to a landowner or a contractor really depends on obviously the revenue that you can get for this feedstock, the product cost, but there's also another element of this and it's often overlooked and that is kind of site preparation. So you can imagine we have a lot of material, you know, um, scattered throughout the forest or piled up at roadside. It becomes an operational hazard. It could become a fire hazard depending on the location and there's an associated cost with then cleaning up that material or burning it. You know, where it lays. If we effectively use this material, which is in everybody's best interest and looking forward for you know, sustainable utilization of resources in Australia, there's actually a cost saving associated with that. We've removed that material, those site preparation or next generation planning costs actually reduce and then become part of that revenue profile. As an example, if we, let's say they, you know, hypothetically you're able to sell um, this raw feedstock in a processed or chip form at $50 a ton, um, but it costs you say $60 to actually produce that, you'd think, oh, well, you're in the negative $10 a ton, but the site preparation savings may be 10 to $20 a ton, you're still better off. Um, so that's all part of this holistic look at the value chain and the supply chain um, regarding you know, feedstocks in the raw form at the low end of the supply chain you know, to optimize that solution and make it viable um, at the end of the day and to feed those other products. Um, so for this particular project, we're actually, in negotiations, or the, you know, the players are in negotiations to make this a viable pathway and solution um, in Queensland. So there's current you know, negotiations going around um, with regards to effective use of this material. Um, and the current you know, and more research basically around modifying those methods and making that more um, economically viable uh, for our partners. But again, it's looking at that biomass as that product. That product then can be used to support any number of uh, bio industries in the future. Well, I'll give it back to Mac or the other presenter, um, but I appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Michael. Much appreciated. Yep, I'll stop my sharing. Thank you. And Jennifer, we've got you back, do we? We do. And I hope you like my background. It, my, it, this is my son's computer, actually. And um, so I've just been surprised with the background myself, but it looks like <laughs> I'm in space somewhere. <laughs> Um, thanks. Thanks. Um, it's great to be back. Um, and I'll just reconnect the slides. And just before we get going, I think we may run out of time for Q&A today, everyone. So apologies for that. But um, uh, if you do have any other questions on any presentations, though, please direct them to Bioenergy Australia and Shahana can jump in perhaps at the end of the session to confirm the best address and those sorts of things. But otherwise, Jennifer, please kick off and, and look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, just to um, um, restate quickly, um, we're focusing on talking about the Collie um, Renewable Diesel Refinery, um, which we have, we're just about to complete a feasibility on. What we did do in, um, before we actually um, um, went down this path, 
was looked at all the different um, technologies that were available and in the um, um, four particular biomass streams. So the biomass streams that we identified in that particular area um, were forestry residues and also um, construction and industrial waste. So um, what we were looking for then was a technology that could utilise um, biomass that was from a woody based material. So we've looked at all the thermochemical processes and biochemical processes, and we came to the conclusion that the high temperature pyrolysis system was the best outcome. And we'll share with you why as we um, go through this presentation. Now, um, just a little bit, just a quick one on Frontier Impact Group. Um, we involved, we don't as much get in, involved in project development, but we, we do at times, and in this case, um, we have. Um, but what our key goal is, is to assist with the funding. So we're technology agnostic, but what we advocate is for the best technology to be used for that particular um, feedstock that is a sustainable life cycle approach that ensures positive environmental social impacts and is collaborative with communities because we think that is um, an essential part of it. On the funding side, we've just developed a JV with a group called Climate Crisis Capital that are a part of um, ARC 2030. Um, and one thing, one aspect that's really important to us is helping fund um, projects that deliver carbon zero by 2030. And this, this um, type of project definitely does. The benefits of this refinery at Collie is um, increased fuel security. And I'm not sure if you know, but in Tassie, there's 600 million litres um, of fuel that gets imported each year. And I think that's quite a risk for um, a state to take on um, from a risk um, um, security issue. Utilisation of waste biomass resources, greater benefit to the economy. Um, so what we've been looking at at Collie is, you know, how can they be utilised for value add? And how can we sort of support um, positive sustainable outcomes such as ecological thinning, fire management, and even restoring land through using energy crops, but not land that's competing with um, land that can be used for food. Supporting a circular economy, um, renewable fuel helping businesses reduce their full, um, footprint. One of the things that's positive with this particular technology, it's a drop in diesel. So no changes need to be made um, to the actual truck um, or to the vehicle. And the pricing of this fuel um, we're, we're looking at is 80 cents a litre, which is competitive with um, conventional diesel. And secondly, it, it attracts a um, carbon um, credit in addition to that. It's a net product, it net produces water. Jobs um, are significant, um, and this is for the smallest um, refinery. 36 direct jobs, 25 construction jobs, and 90 in, in, indirect jobs. And the biomanufacturing opportunities are huge with biochar and graphene, which we'll mention shortly um, a bit further, and wood vinegar. Um, with wood vinegar, the greatest benefit of that is to be used in the agricultural space. And I understand that a lot of fertilisers are actually brought into Tasmania. This would enable um, Tasmania have a um, fertiliser um, enhancer um, which, which um, helps in the nutrient uptake in plants, which is really beneficial. What I also like about this um, technology um, is it's smaller scale. So you only need 50,000 tonnes of bone dry waste. It's not one that's 300,000 tonnes. Because I, I find if you have to go any further than 100 kilometres, it's actually the economics are harder to stack up. And, and if you could, it'd be great to be within 50, 50 kilometres. Um, just a little bit about the technology and I'll race through these because I know I'm the last um, presenter. It's a commercially proven technology. So um, what we're going to be delivering in Collie is something that's already operating um, in the US. And there's two, two key components of this system. Um, it's the biomass processing system that produces the syngas production system through high temperature pyrolysis. And it also produces a biochar that's a high quality. And through, um, through, through, through the syngas process, it produces wood vinegar and the water. And there's a dis distillation process that produces the renewable diesel. In terms of the highlights, um, it produces each um, small plant produces 19 million litres of renewable diesel, but they're scalable um, and can be, what we like is they can be allocated in, in closest to where the source is. 
um, 8,300 tonnes of high quality biochar and 6.5 million litres of wood vinegar that would be beneficial for land restoration. Um, the other facts we've already presented, the capital investment is 100 to 110 million and the return on capital is modelled at around 15%. Um, um, percent. Um, performance insurance is also available and that's something that we're negotiating for the colleagues site as well. Um, so just um, very quickly, um, the real positives of this project is, because I've got the 50 seconds, is the commercial um, viability of it and um, the 80 cents for the renewable fuel. But then we also have the wood vinegar biochar and graphene. And graphene is particularly um, valuable. It's the thinnest material ever devised, 200 times stronger than steel and the most conductive material in the world. We're collaborative with the approach that we take. This is um, a picture of what the biofuel refinery would look like. And we are seeking interest in Tasmania to get involved in our project. Um, and given the low cost of, of fuel, um, and given the co-benefits of um, um, the other industries that could be developed that you could see on this slide, the opportunities are enormous. Um, so, and we're particularly interested in those- Jennifer, we're about to get cut off in two seconds. I just want to say a big thank you.